Oi you, it's time for another episode of Dorothy and the Dealer. Let's tune into the conversation. Here we go. <laughs> Woohoo! We're really Hello, excited Thomas. today about our special guest, <laughs> um, our beautiful client, Lisa Lucas, all the way from Brisbane. You're in Brisbane, in Queensland, aren't you, Lisa? Yes. Welcome yes, to am. Dorothy and the Dealer. Welcome to Dorothy and the Dealer, oh, Lisa. Thank Hi. you. Thanks so much for having me on. Do you know, it feels like we should have had you on ages ago because it's just especially because your kids are great big fans of they are. us and our um and, and the mm. intro um and the intro um to Dorothy the song, the dealer, the intro to song theme yeah, yeah, yeah. to Dorothy and the dealer. Um, we think, see, we've seen them doing must, it. It's pretty cute. I think they must hear it in their sleep. Because really? we, yeah, yeah. Because Mick and I were, if we're in the car together, we we listen at the Dorothy and the dealer together. And when we travel, nice. that's all they heard. Yeah. <laughs> that's very cute. That's very cute. Yeah. Well, you yeah. know how it starts because you listen, obviously. So um, you want to share a song before we get started? Yeah. What's the song? So my, my song at the moment that um, I play like every day to get me pumped up is um, Raise Your Glass by Pink. <gasps> pink. Oh, yeah. Pink. Really do. You really raise your big glass pink when you are wrong. In yep. all the right ways, all my. Da, da, da. I don't remember the words right now. I'm, I'm pretty sure I feel it. I'm, I'm like that crazy person when you stop at the lights, you know, dancing Sing it. to it. Yeah, so yeah. sing some for us. Go on, Come on mate. Lisa. Get it out. God, that pressure's How on, else? guys. I'm a terrible How singer. How <laughs> I can't ch- even think of the words. Uh, I'll do the, just the three. Raise Ray. your glass. <laughs> I'll tell you a story about that song. I have a song with um, my niece and my nephew. My niece's song is um, uh, I Wish I Was a Punk Rocker by Sandy Tom and Lola yeah. has kind Wish of was a punk rocker. Lola's kind of stolen that song. Mm-hmm. Um, but my nephew, my song with him is the pink one, Raise Your Glass, because yeah. when he was um, younger, I used to go to, I used to pick him up from school in my red convertible mm-hmm. and he would always want me to play that song really, really, really loud to embarrass his sister when we were picking her up in the convertible. So that's the song we would play. Bam, bam, bam. Is that it? So yeah, yeah, yeah. raise your mm. glass if you it's very I like good. It. It's good song. <laughs> I like pink. You know, when we were in California, we were uh, on the boardwalk in California and we went past um, uh, the trapeze place where she started to learn trapeze. And what happened was she was walking on the boardwalk and she thought, wouldn't it be really cool to be able to do this in a concert? She went in and spoke to the guy um, who was doing all the teaching of trapeze and um he was like yeah cool you should come do it so she literally uh, started training there with those guys on the board have you seen the fun house dvd Is oh yeah house? i've seen yeah, yeah. Have, you seen say, have, have you seen her live have you seen her live? no because when, when she plays live she's literally on a trapeze the whole time swinging well, she's, she's doing all sorts of random and stuff. singing at the same time like it's just what a feat yeah, yeah, really awesome. Awesome. um okay so Let's have a chat. What Who was it? are you, you were Lisa saying, Lucas? Well, Who you were, are you? Can I just say, you were saying that um, Mick, Mick wanted you to mention a song or something? Oh, yeah. Right? He wanted me to say that my song was Hits from the Bong from Cypress Hill, just so that he could have Mick sing it. Mick Hits from it. the Bong. <laughs> <laughs> it's from the barn. I can tell you when that song came out, I was definitely uh, not of sane mind. And I would have had many hits from the barn. I'm pretty sure that's why, you know, you can do spirits, you and him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've got this funny little video of Zach when it was on the radio and Zach's, you know, singing and doing these, you know, fingers up in the back of the car. It's very cute. Yeah. That's very cute. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. what you teach your four-year-old, isn't it? It's exactly no, that's right. That's what yeah. you teach your <laughs> so this is a bong song, right? No, Mitch. Disclaimer. No, maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> okay, so um, how about we get started and you um, just share part of your story with us, Lisa, especially about what life was like um, leading up to meeting us and before you did any work, you know, with us about, you know, transformation stuff, you know? Yeah, it was, was quite, a, like? 
was quite a whirlwind when I met you guys. I'll never forget seeing you for the first time. But How long before, ago was it? I think, well, I've been in Brisbane just over five years and I met you probably six months after I moved. So, right. yeah, yeah. But um, I... Jesus, is it that long? Is it that yeah. long? It feels, I know, well, oh, Zach crazy. Is, Zach, is, Zach is four in a couple of months and, I, wow. you know, we didn't even, we weren't even pregnant with him when we met you guys. So, wow. um, yeah, so I I had got, I was at a, a Juice Plus conference. Mm-hmm. I yes. had, you know, in my infinite wisdom pre um, meeting you guys, I just tried to make money anyway and in every way I possibly could because, so I'm, because I'm a nurse, I always thought that I'd have all this money. I've had financial freedom because you're never out of the job. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know there's always a paycheck coming and when you don't have to worry about a paycheck coming you don't you get into this mentality or, or I did that it was free flowing so I didn't have to worry about it didn't have to hold on to it so I was mm. very very good at spending money and Mick <laughs> was very very much the same so we were a bad couple and he was the same he'd always worked his work since he was 14 years old mm-hmm. so we had plenty of money coming in but every every tax year we'd we'd look at our income and think, where the hell did all that money go? Because not only have we got none of it, but we we se- seem to accumulate all this debt. And we had multiple credit cards each and you know personal mm. loans coming out of our ears. And um so we thought, well, we're just gonna make more money. So it didn't never occur to us we had to get better with the money coming in. We just had to make more of it. <laughs> mm. so, um, you know, I had the had the juice plus come business and I went to the conference and that's where I met you guys and I remember seeing you on stage and I remember you Mitch saying um that you know if you someone had said if you could fuck up your life this much imagine if you put all that energy into creating something great what you could achieve and I thought wow imagine if Mm. I could take all that energy I put into spending my money (laughs) yeah Mm. actually you know focus it somewhere else and and I thought that was fantastic Mm. so um I hogtied Mick to mastermind and money. <laughs> <laughs> Told him I can't go alone. I don't want to sit on my own. And, you know, that old chestnut. And mm. uh, he thought he was going to be the supportive husband for half a day and then run away. And yeah. <laughs> the rest is history. He couldn't, he couldn't get out of the seat. And funny, I've got to tell this story last mastermind and money because we go every time you're here. Yeah, yeah I love last that. Last mastermind, he was there and he'd won tickets to the football for the whole weekend mm. and he couldn't get himself to leave Mastermind and Money to go to the football. Every every time he'd say, I'd say, what time are you going? He's like, oh, I'll go half. I'll go, I got lunch and lunch should be gone. I'm like, when's she going to go? Oh, uh, I don't really want to watch this game. I'll, I'll, I'll go the next one. And it was the whole weekend. Oh, uh, it's so cute. Oh, that's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> he had good seats as well, right? You know, yeah, I, remember you guys, I remember you guys in that room and I remember like it was every couple that turns up in the room, they have you, you visually see different things. You know, you see the husband comes in who's awkward. And then within about 10 minutes, he's kind of like, hold on a minute. And then within half an hour, he's like, Jesus. And and he's either going to run out the door or he's strapped himself into the chair <laughs> and he's put his helmet on and got right. This, this is making some sense. And, you know, some of them, it makes so much sense that it's just too scary for them. So they just don't make it. You know, they just. And then what they'll do is they'll drag the wife out of the room with them and they'll do a runner and you never see them again. But then, I mean, our process is to filter that out. We want, you know, at the beginning, we want to say, this is what we're going to talk about. And if you want to, you know, if you want to talk about, you know, the delusion around money and you want to, you think you come here for some quick fix or quick trick, if you're in the wrong motherfucking room, get out. But if you're in here because you actually get that you're able to put the time and effort in, but the problem is, is, you're doing, you know, you're you're doing the right thing, but in the wrong place. Do you know what I mean? You're spinning your wheels yeah. in the mud, and you're not getting any traction. And so, it's a lot of the time the ones that stick around are the ones that you know we very much target how, what we're saying to them, and we're playing to what we want them to hear and what we want them to know. And so, I remember Mick in the room, and I remember. By the time we got to the end, the end of probably the first day, he was like one of those husbands who was just like, shit, you know, talk about calling it as it is. And he was really in, you know, and it's funny, whenever I see Mick, you know, 
he's such a lovely fella. You know, he just he just gets me and I get him and you know there's it's really good it's really cute. I have a real soft good. spot for me yeah, yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> everybody <just> does <laughs> yeah well well that's I mean that's the other thing pre meeting you guys was Mick and I Mick and I've been together I was 18 years old when I met him so we've right. been together for 20 20 years mm. and we've been married just 14 years we celebrated 14 years last weekend mm. and he, thank you we have had such one of those relationships that you think, what are they doing? Like, yeah. they, we just were very, we used to say we're very passionate. Really, we were just crazy. We just yeah. loved, like screamed at each other. I left him twice, once yeah. before we got married, once after. We just couldn't mm. seem to be in the right place at the right time together. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I think we were very lucky in that we just never gave up. One of us always wouldn't give the other one up, even yeah. though, you know weren't always happy but definitely since doing all this work and I think that's one of the best things I'll I'll be ever grateful that I've managed to hog time to that room because going through the process with him I never would have been able to explain it to him had I not done it with him and so he's just in he's just like you say Mitch he was just 100% in I signed up for everything and he signed up for everything yeah all the other seminars separately we didn't even know we'd done it you know because um we had we were separated at lunchtime and when we came back to each other we had that she's gonna be mad and she thought (laughs) I hope hope she gives me the money and we both were like yeah why wouldn't we do this Mm -hmm. so I, I think that's been another great thing that we've been able to do it together yeah, and, and, yeah. but you know i think that that's what kind of makes a marriage you know marriages people are delusional about marriages they're thinking they're meant to be you know cupcakes rainbows and unicorns and yeah. they're fucking not you know marriage like marriage is tough man it's one of the toughest oh. institutions it's the, the hardest thing i've ever had to do and i've done like you know my history i've been in prison and everything it's the hardest thing i've ever had to do is keep a marriage together Mm. it's it's not easy but that's that's part of the thing you know it's ebbs and flows it's your peaks and troughs it's it's pleasure and pain that's life do you know what I mean and it's about you find yourself and being able to manage that and you find your love and being able to manage the ebbs and the flows and the peaks and the troughs and you need them to keep you to keep you accountable and keep you together Mm. do you know what I mean yeah yeah 100 I think our ebbs and flows aren't quite as bad as they used to be as well you know of course yeah we, we understand ourselves better and each other better well that's the key right as you evolve you realize it's actually not about the other person they're just mirroring something for you Mm. that you haven't seen and you haven't learned so you recognize that it's when you take responsibility for that aspect of them in yourself then you know things start to shift you know a lot of people prior to this work would want to blame the other person after doing the work they realize there's no point in any of that you're best to look inside of yourself rather than trying to sort it out outside because transformation doesn't happen out there. It happens Mm. in here, you know. Mm. So then where to from there, Lise, once you did um, Mastermind and Money, because that was in Brisbane, but then you Mm. didn't come, you didn't do relationships and you... It was like another year year later. Yeah. Mm. And so did you implement all the money stuff up until that point? Uh, (laughs) Kind of. It was so arrogant. We were so arrogant. When I look back now, I think, oh, my God. We came to the seminar because we couldn't get our shit together and we left and we were like, yes, I'm gonna, we're going to do this. And then within a mm. week we were like, oh, we'll kind of half do it. And we we had a, had a chat to you guys after Mastermind Money. I'll never forget it. And we had already bought a caravan, of like mm. this massive brand-new caravan to travel Australia, and we we figured we would sort all our money out and be able to go. And when we told we told you, Mitch, we said, oh, we, you know, our money situation is going to change because Mick was going to stop working and we were going to live off my nursing, but, you know, maternity leave, which is like next to nothing. And you said, I know you're not going to want to hear this, but you haven't earned the right to do that yet. And we're like, oh, yep, yep, yep. And we walked out and looked at each other and they're like, we're still going, right? Yeah, of course we're going. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so off we went with the intention of meeting you guys in Perth to go to RMY. So we we got there. Um, it was not quite a year later. It was just under a year later. Yeah. And did RMY. But by the time we had got there, we had no money, mm. like none. I remember, and, yeah. Yeah, we, we were struggling a lot. And we 
we didn't really know where to go from there. We'd, we'd camped in um, Perth for like I don't know, six or eight weeks or something so that I could work so that we could get a bit of income. But, yeah, we had like $50 or $100 in the bank mm. and um, we were lost. Mm. We were completely lost. Mm. And we stood in front of you guys and cried. I cried. Michael just stood there, shocked <laughs> state that he is. And um, <laughs> said, I, I, like, we, we've got nothing. I'm like, what do we do? And he said, mm. it's all right. We've got this, but you've got to do this, this, this. We did it. But I think the best thing is that when we made the decision to, no, we're, like, this is ridiculous, we we found these people for a reason. We, you guys turned up in our mm. life for a reason. We've got to listen to what they say. We have, we're not getting anywhere on our like our own decision making. Clearly, mm. we need to actually implement this. So we implemented it, but we we went home. We got all our books out. We did all the work, and two days later, Mick hadn't even started looking for work yet. All we had done was put all the wealth principles in place. We got some money to get home. And we, I had contacted my boss and said, when can I come back to work? Like, I need to come back now. And two days later, he had two companies contact him, wanting mm. him to come home mm. and work. And they started this bidding war over who would get him and what job was better and how much they could offer him. And, mm. and he said, I can't believe this has happened when he hadn't even, he hadn't even asked for anything yet. It mm, just sort yeah. of appeared. And it was because we had made the decision like this is what's going to happen this is you know we put it out to the universe and it provided and I think that's a really important point because I know like I, I suppose you know you've just said you came and did the seminar but you didn't really implement the work um that's the first thing the mastermind of money now the reason that that happens is because people think that money is just about the money side of it. So they don't realise that it actually, the mind part of the seminar is actually really super important, the mindset part, right? So what will happen is, is that we will, people, and this is from our personal experience from before we started doing any of the work on ourselves as well, we sabotage things because we subconsciously make um, these choices to, um, uh, you know, to not go ahead to do what we know we need to do. So we hand people the principles, but the people who who make it work for them are the people that actually implement them. But not just that, they have to sort the mind stuff out because mm -hmm. if you don't sort the mind stuff out, the rest of it doesn't work because no. you will subconsciously sabotage it. As soon as you did relationships new and you sh shifted the mindset stuff, and then made the call to do it. That's when everything fell into place. And people will think that that's a coincidence, but it's mm. not a coincidence. It's mm. a matter of you resonating energetically with the, the result that you're looking for and with the outcome that you want. Before that and prior to that point, you weren't doing that. And it's like um, the best way I have to describe it is that um, if you're sitting in a room, like right now we're sitting in a room, and technically there's radio stations playing in this room right now, mm -hmm. but we can't hear them because we don't have anything that's tuned in to that frequency. As soon as we tune in to that frequency, then we can access the, the music, the sound that's coming that way. It's exactly the same thing with the money. It's exactly the same thing with our mindset, right? As soon as you yeah. guys tuned in to the frequency that it's all around you, this is it, we're going to do this, we're going to, we're going to step up, we've got this, then it all happens. And it happens in a way that seems like a miracle, but it's actually not a miracle because if you know how science works, there's a reason why the radio station is playing in here right now. But people don't get that they call it a miracle because they don't understand that that's actually how nature works mm -hmm. there's a system that makes that happen and that's what um, um that's what we're teaching in the mastermind of money principles we're not teaching about money we're teaching about the system that makes it all actually run you know the laws that make it work so i love hearing stories and i love that people get to hear stories like that least because people um hear us telling these stories all of the time. Oh, and there was this person that did this and this person that did this, but it's important that they hear it from, from the person that it's actually happened to so that it's mm. so that they can get that it's not it's not a it's not something that we just made up. It's something that actually happens to people when I, they put I, their I, commitment I, in. I think as well though that what happens for people is they get to a point where they have no other option. Like, yeah. uh, you know, the amount of people that I sit with and guys and I say, 
Just do what I'm telling you to do and everything will fall into place. So people think that that's, if somebody was saying that to me, I'd think, well, what the fuck would I do what you're telling me to do? Well, because what you're telling yourself to do is not fucking working, right? Yeah. Because it has you in a situation where, and this is the conversation I have with guys, has you in a situation where you got $50 and you're over the other side of the country and you need to get fucking home yeah. and you're living in a fucking tent. What well, the fuck? And- so what, what happens is that pain gets so much that people have no other option but to do something. But there's something that we're telling them, like, you know, I, I say this all the time to people. Your history is littered with concepts of impossible. It's not, it's impossible. It's impossible, but it's, it's not it, and the difference between impossible and possible is not a miracle. It's a fucking system. It's a system. And if you follow the system and the system, nature has a system, you know, and attached to that system are, are, are is, is, you know, is a, a language, you know, there's a language to that system and it takes, time before people hear the language of what you're saying to them well, this is and what... tune into it and then they're able to go from you know impossible to possible you know and and like i said it's it's not a miracle it's it's a fucking system and if you follow the system you can't get it wrong because nature has a system upon which it bases everything including how we exchange energy mm. and and money is just energy. 100%. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So can I just say something about that? Because when you say, I've, I've, over, I've heard you say, that, just mm. do what I tell you to do. We're not doing it to say I'm the boss and I'm dictating. That's right, yeah. It's about saying what your system, the system you're running mm-hmm. is based on your own self-sabotaging mindset and belief systems and ideas and loyalties this system that I'm going to show you, if you just follow along for the time being, you will see that nature works, the laws work. Yeah. It's not about going following you. No. It's about saying. I wouldn't fucking follow you. <laughs> it's not about saying do what I do in the sense that yeah. I never make a mistake. It's about saying what I'm going to show you now is the way that yeah. the system yeah. works yeah. and that the laws work. And if you follow the laws, then you're going to see that it's possible to get an outcome that's different to the outcome that you've already got or that you've always got. But I think what's important here with the guys was that also the mindset part of it. Uh-huh. Like I can, yeah. I can, we hand people, you, you, I do it at the beginning of mass amount of money. I go, if you want to be financially free and never have to worry about money again, just follow what's in this book, but you won't follow what's in the book. Do you know what I mean? And the reason you won't follow what's in the book is because you have a subconscious motive to stay safe and safe for you is I know how to fuck up money and handle it. I know how to be broke well, and handle it. Well, that's why that's why we were able to do it because we got out of our own way. We shifted out those thoughts, that self-sabotaging thoughts that we were having. We were actually able to listen to you because mm. we've yeah. done that. You know, we've, yeah. we've done yeah. that equilibration process. Yeah, because it really is after relationships and you that you're able to have those deeper conversations. Does that make sense? Where you're able to go, so do you get now that, you know, now that we got that out of the way, we're able to follow the system to do what needs to be done. And I mean, for us, you know, we provide for people all the coaching, everything they need. It's all part of what they buy into. And it goes you know, and they, they get coached by Mills, who's, you know, one of the co-creators of the fucking thing. And so, it, like, it, they can't get it wrong as long as they follow the system. So just on that, just going backtrack a bit, Lise, with with your experience at Relationships and You, what did you sort out? Like, what did you, what realisation and what what moment did you have and what why did that make a difference? Well, my... My dad was a drinker and he was never, he was emotionally abusive, but he was, he, he used to be emotionally abusive to the people around me and use me as a way to make them feel bad. So he would, you know, he would use me in his example and why my brother wasn't good enough. And then he'd use me in his example Uh. as why my mother wasn't a good enough mother and she wasn't ever going to, you know, be what I will one day be. Right. um, You know, he was, he sort of deflected, to on to me but yeah. he was he was never directly cruel to me it was always somebody else um and so i i built up this belief in my head that one i wasn't good enough because i kept listening to him say it to everybody else but also that if i did well that it made other others feel bad right. and so i needed to not do well because it might hurt someone else it might impact mm. somebody else how they feel and i had this overwhelming need to not have anyone feel bad, not have anyone not like me. 
because yeah. that's you know that's the the relationship that dad had created or the story that I had played yeah. in my head all that yeah. time so actually um, Mick was um, the person that I that I did the process uh, yeah. with that you have to you know yeah and um, it was overwhelming as well because I'd had my moment um, staring at Mick and it was mm. quite overwhelming and I think that that oh, he was, he was, he, 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 he was your dad. He was your surrogate. He, he was my, dad. yeah, he was my surrogate. So wow. I was looking at him talking to my dad, but Mick was there. And, and he, Mick will tell, tell you that he remembers how his equilibration felt, but he can't remember any of the things said. He, like, he struggles with yeah. that memory, but he normal. remembers mine yeah. because it was such a beautiful moment. So I was able, I think that's the biggest thing for me. What did my you get in that moment? I got, I got that he was, all he was doing was making sure that I was strong enough and tough enough, one, to withstand a relationship with Michael because it wasn't, hasn't been easy, but he's gorgeous yeah. and I wouldn't have it any other way. But also he gave me my mum and my brother, like he, he drew me very close to them. He told me because I had this awful, you know, perception of him he told me never to become a nurse and I became a nurse it was like spite it was like he was <laughs> pushing me to do it like I'm gonna yeah. do it anyway yeah. and you know I'm, I'm I'm very good at my job I'm very mm-hmm. very good and I think it was definitely a, a calling that was that I was supposed to have yeah um so I was able to take that and realize that I actually don't have to hide from my success I'm definitely not mediocre and believing and telling myself all these years that I am was just stopping me from actually creating what I was supposed to create, which yeah. is what I've created now with, you know, my family and my career. So it was quite overwhelming. But I also have to reflect regularly to see that because I can feel mm. it, you know, come back so like consciously. I can feel myself doing it sometimes. And I see people, I see their success, and I'm like, oh, I wish I was like them. And I think I'm not them, I'm me, and I'm still yeah. fantastic. I don't have to be like that person. So Yeah, I think it's so important to get that. I think so many people think or don't realise how much um, their experience, uh, like their early experiences, impact how they go with money. And that would have been an underlying aspect all the way through. Even though you want to consciously get ahead subconsciously, it's not happening for you because no. you're you're um, you're feeling like if I get ahead, other people are going to be let down. Um, and it's really normal that when as you go through now, that you will still see that because that there are different levels to getting that. Like the you you can't undo. Would you agree? You can't undo yeah. what you got. You can never go back there, right? No. But um, you get a level of success and you, we'll talk about where you're at now as well so, so that, you know, people can understand where, where you've come to. But you get a level of success and then you think, oh, maybe, but then, like, and you stay there, then you think, actually, there's more for me and there's more for me. So those, those um, that process of um, doubting yourself, people want to get rid of that part of themselves but that's actually a super important part because it mm. helps you to push forward because it helps you to go actually and reminds you that you're there is somewhere more for you to do there's something more for you to do there is somewhere more for you to be does does that make sense yeah. and i feel like that's a that's a, an important part that people don't want to recognize sometimes that you need to have these moments where you're like oh and it's a reminder that you're not in the place that you were and no. the level of like if this is where I was and this is where I am, the difference between where I want to be and where I was is no different. It's just a matter of, you know, moving towards that and having a go- having that plan to go towards that, you know. The level yeah. of discomfort in this space is the same as is in this space. It's just you want to be more, you're just familiar with this level of discomfort, you know, Mm. the lower level of discomfort instead of going, I actually, there's the same level of discomfort here. I'm just going to be, it's just unfamiliar to me. So we don't want to step into that, but it's, Mm. that's our reminder to go, right. This is, this is the next place I can be, you know? Yeah. You were, you were speaking a few weeks back at our seminar in Brisbane, you were telling everybody where you're at and and Mm. where you've come to. Do you want to share a little bit about that for us? Yeah. Sure. I am. Um, so I am doing 
the same job I was doing beforehand, before relationships and you. Um, I've worked at different places, but the same level. So I'm not necessarily making more money, but certainly I'm very financially successful, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we, we've obviously, we've got rid of all our debt. Michael continues to get pay rises, which is, he's, you know, fantastic. And even though he he doesn't put out any, you know, CVs or anything, like every couple of weeks, couple of times a week, he comes and says, a recruiter rang me again. They want me to really? do this. They can't afford me. And <laughs> so he's yeah. really, you know, put forward his worth to the universe. But I, I am so much more successful because I'm not afraid of it. And like, you know, I've um, yeah. implemented initiatives around the state that are now being put in emergency departments all over. I've, I'm on multiple statewide advisory boards to, you know, for innovation and creation in, in my chosen field. I, um, I have, have been fought over of two, you know, emergency departments wanting me. I was nurse of the year last year as well, which was so yeah. fantastic because the year of the pandemic, I remember I'm quite a history buff, so I love a bit of history. And I always used to watch, you know, things about the war or, um, you know, the Spanish flu epidemic or the plague. And I used to think, oh, my God, could you imagine being a nurse then? And then when the pandemic hit, I was like, this is our chance, you know, this is like our Olympics, this is what we train for. Um, and then to get nurse of the year just purely because of, you know, the, the giant push that, you know, myself and my colleagues made to get us ready for something, um, which fortunately didn't, didn't end up coming to us, thank goodness, um, was quite humbling. And yeah. I thought of my grandma immediately, gave me gooseies all over. It was so fantastic. was your grandmother a nurse? My grandma was the matriarch of the family, yes. Yeah? She was the first one. She nursed in um, London. She, right. she didn't nurse during the war. She was, you know, younger during the war. But mm-hmm. um, she was one of, you know, that um, show called The Midwife? Have you seen yeah. that one? Yeah, yeah, she was one of those on the bike. With the, right. I've got her little belt that she used to wear. Um, right. But, yeah, she, she was the first one. All the, all the women except my mum are nurses in my family. Wow. Um, and uh, what else happened? Oh, lots, lots of things have happened. But financially, Meg and I are debt-free. Mm-hmm. We have our beautiful, brand new, beautiful home here, and we have one in Townsville um, that Mick's sister lives in. We are currently trying to decide what new car to buy, which is such a difficult decision mm-hmm. when he wants. Do I get the know. Lamborghini? Do I <laughs> get the Ferrari? <laughs> <laughs> it's very nice to be in a position where we don't have to worry about how much the car costs. We can just buy the one we want. So you should tell Mick to ring me and I'll show him how to get the car he wants out of the boss. Yes, I will. Well, you have to watch this space because we're actually having a meeting with Mike um, to set up an exciting new business venture. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. That's cool. So he's finally he's finally realized he's He's finally realised what his mission in life is and right. um, and how he's going to m- make sure that he's living in line with his values more and more every day. Because so. he was talking to me about his mission of pole dancing for years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Could you imagine? What, yeah, I know. What are the, <laughs> one of the things um, I, I you brought up earlier was the whole thing of wanting to be liked, you know? Yes. People wanting to be liked by other people. And... You know, it's it's one of the things it comes up all the time when I'm dealing with people and I'm dealing with clients that one of the big things is that they don't want to be disliked by someone. And they and I, I think everybody goes through it. You know, I, I, I know from my own father, it was a fucking huge challenge. for him. And my dad's just downright a lovely fella. And I know for me, for years, it's taken a lot of. Um, understanding who I am to be able to manage that and understand what's happening because people really use it as a threat because everybody suffers from it and everybody knows the pain of it I'm not going to like you and I'm going to say this about you if you blah 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 does that make sense Mm. and so I had I mean how did you overcome that how did you you know do you think it was the fact that you had no other option and it was like listen I'm fucking that far south I don't give a fuck what anybody else says. I'm just going to do what needs to be done. And if they don't like me, fuck off. You know what I mean? I 
I, I honestly think it was just being more and more comfortable with the person I am and, yeah. and exactly thinking, well, I, 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 I used to say oh, I don't care what they think, but I used to physically cripple me if, mm. if people mm. were mad at me. It was mm. awful. Whereas now it, it doesn't take me, I don't pro- occupy my mind with that low-end bullshit anymore. Yeah. Like yeah. I just... Yeah, just I'm very, very comfortable with the the skin I'm in, and mm. I'm be forty next year, and I'm not even a little bit going to have a breakdown about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm forty, I'm 40 next year. Well. Oh, sure. Yeah, I don't have time. I don't have time to worry about what other people think of me because mm. the people that care about me are behind me, egging me on. So I don't, yeah. I don't give a shit anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's cool. And that's really that's cool. cool. I mean, that's a good message for anybody out there. And you know, I think one of the things I learned was when somebody doesn't like me and they're they're you know they're swimming around in that um, place, it, it, you want to dive in and not like them either and stuff. And and it's just about understanding that that's just where they're at and that's their potential growth point and that's their potential. So you're obviously showing them something about themselves that they're destined to understand and they're destined to love about themselves. So it's about holding that space and not jumping into that pool with them. You know, it's about being able to go, look, that's okay. I, I don't need you to like me. You know, I don't, that's not what I need. No. What I would love to see happen is that you love yourself enough to love whatever you dislike in me, in you, you know? Mm. And I think that, that that's a big growth opportunity for anybody who's not feeling who's listening to this going fuck you know if i feel as i feel as if i get ahead or i feel as if i pick up the reins in my life or i feel as if i start to get my money organized that i'm going to leave people behind mm-hmm. i'm going to disappoint someone mm-hmm. i'm going to make people around me not feel enough and i don't want to do that so i'm being loyal to their poverty mentality or loyal to their their position in life and the only person you got to be loyal to is really yourself yeah 100%. you know what i mean and i think I, I think it's important to say that you know, when a person was, was in the position that you were in, which was they couldn't fall any further south, you know, when you let, that's life going, I'm going to keep taking things off you until you get that you're here to do something. And I've provided the whole map, all the systems, everything you need to get there, and you're here to fucking do something. And so I think that that life has that play on us. And, and when we think about that, life's willing to be disliked in order for us to be able to pick up the reins of where we want to go and do what it is we're actually here to do, you know? And that's what the, that's what the pressure of life is. Life is not fucking cruel. It doesn't beat us up. It's not that small-minded. It's actually designed for you to actually fulfill your dreams and go and get what you want and achieve the things, you know? Mm. I think um, I think it also helps that I used to, I, I am very much like my father and so mm. because I spent all that time all those years having this you know altered percept or, or lopsided perception of who mm. he was and what mm. he did to me mm. um I've learned to love the parts that are like him yeah. because even though I and it's difficult to explain to someone even though I don't necessarily forgive him for things I am grateful for what he has given me and I'm actually grateful for you know some of the things that I didn't want to own I didn't want to believe that I was anything like him and I am Mm. like him and the things that I didn't want to own are part of my success you know the fact Mm. that I've owned them and I use them to my advantage now um has made a big difference and well, it's, I, 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 we said we say to people all the time you have shadow and light sides you know and their values to you you're so you're you have shadow values you know parts that you hide but you need them do you know what i mean yeah. and i think also one of the things we really try to ram home and letting it go is forgiveness plays into the illusion that they fucked up but when you're truthful and you stop and count the blessings you're grateful you know, your, yeah. your heart opens and you realize there's nothing to forgive here. There's the, if yeah. I, every single step and and every single position they took was about me opening my heart and realizing who I am and why I'm why I'm here, you know. And then um, I, I just I love when people get that and they're like, fuck, you thought so I should never tell my kids to say sorry. No, never tell your children to say sorry. Right. Teach your children what was going on and show them how to manage their emotions and regulate and understand who they are based on what you perceive as the mistake. Because forgiveness plays into the illusion that something was wrong and nothing was wrong and nothing you wrong. see the balance. Um, just before we finish up, Lisa, in terms of being a parent and in terms of um, 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 your kids, um, what, what do you feel um, 
has shifted over these last five years? It's funny because Mick and I have very different parenting styles. I don't know if you could have picked that. Um, and the things that we used to fight about pre the last five years was money, which we've literally never fight about, which is great. Um, and the kids really and great. how we bring the kids up. And, right. and now it's never, it's not a fight now because we use, we use the lingo with each other. And so as soon as we, we fire into, you, you know, you can't do that or whatever it is, um, then one of us will fight back with, you know, just very balanced, you're going to regret that, this, this is just you, they're just reflecting what's, what's happening for you, <laughs> and that the other person has nothing to argue with because mm. we know we know that all they're doing is reflecting all the things back on us that we've mm. not learned to love in ourselves. Yeah. So it has 100% changed both of us as parents, the kids we we are trying very hard to teach the kids that in order to be good parents for them we need to make sure that we are good to ourselves because we were very much it's all about the kids and don't worry about us and we've got to be here for the kids and mm. you know we often will take time out just for the two of us or you know make or have them and I'll go and the kids will say that our older two will say well, why can't we go it's like because sometimes it just needs to be us and we need to take care of ourselves because we want to teach you that when you get to your age, our age that you're going to take care of yourself as well. This, this mm. is about self-love. So it de- definitely has changed us as parents. The kids are thriving, which is really good. So, oh, I love that. Yeah, they, they go to Montessori schools and Nate has gone from completely failing and, and stepping back and disengaging from school to he's in full force. And the last parent-teacher interview, you know, You've always got one that's, you know, really thriving and mm. teacher interviews are always glowing and one you think, oh, I don't really have to go to this one. Um, and they did a complete flip last time. So Nate's like the star pupil, and which was really nice. I remember, the, I remember that whole dilemma of getting him into Montessori and all that stuff as well, you know, being able to afford that. Now it's just yeah. part of what you do, you know. I love yeah. that. Mm. I love that. And that's it's really good. good. It's so important to teach kids. I think the biggest lesson a parent can teach their kid is to put themselves first and the only way they do that is because you know they have to lead by example you can't tell a kid that you've got to show them that and that's what you guys are doing which I love I I also think it as well there in terms of you know the concept of getting your kids into school and then you know now it's like you know where before I was like oh how are we going to do it and once you do it life adapts to you and so life says you've got to follow what it is you want to do and I will adapt mm. for you. And then and the beauty is, is that that concept becomes the norm. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's like, what do we want to do? Life will adapt. What do we want to do? Life will adapt. Where the opposite to that is I can't do what I want to do because life is not providing what yes. I need. Do you know yeah. what I mean? When it, in actual fact, you know, we cause a reality. We cause the things that we want to have in our lives. And once we start to have the first experience of that, we're like, fuck, wow, everything fell into place. And then that just becomes the norm. You don't question it anymore. You're like, no, no, no I'm going to do this. Like, don't worry, life will adapt. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. 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 Cool. Um, I was just, can I just share a little story random? Mm-hmm. Um, but you know how you always t- say to the kids, Mitch, you say, who's at number one? And they go, me, Yeah. you know? Well, Lola calls me last night. She FaceTimes me at the most random times. I'm cooking dinner and stuff. Mm-hmm. She's got a brand new sewing machine because she's really good and really creative with that. She doesn't know how to use it yet. So I told her I'd go around and show her. And she goes, can you come now? And I went, um, no, I'm in the middle <laughs> of freaking cooking. I have a life. She goes, Millie, who's the most important person in your life? me <laughs> so she, she's trying to use it against me by uh, she's a little cheeky bugger isn't she um but yeah it's so important to teach our kids that and um lisa i just i love talking to you i love um that you share your story i love the transformation and that is down to you and mick doing the work it's never going to be a smooth sailing ride it's not meant to be a smooth sailing ride it, life is meant to have its ups and downs it's meant to have its ebbs and flows but when we know how to handle it and when we take life by the horns instead of waiting for life to happen to us then everything is possible and everything can move and shift and grow. And um, I really appreciate you and Mick for all your love and support. And um, I just, yeah, I love you. Thanks so much for sharing with us today. Thank you guys. Thanks. We love you. Listen, <laughs> listen again, uh, we, we really appreciate the time. And also um, 
and I didn't realize it had been that long since we met, but well done guys. You've really, really kicked ass and that's great. It's great to be able, you're a great testament as to what can happen when you, you just go for it. And yeah. Don't Thanks. Fall. And I'll see you guys in the Oh, yeah, a few, a few weeks because weeks, you're Woo! doing the training with us. Yeah, Next excited. level, baby. <laughs> All right, awesome. Mom. Lots of love, Lisa. And big Thanks, kisses guys. and hugs to Mitch too. Go and Mitch, Mitch. Mitch. Not Mitch. <laughs> big hugs oh, my God. <laughs> see delete, you guys. delete. See you. Love you. Bye. If you found this information inspiring, make sure you subscribe and tune in to the next Dorothy and the Dealer podcast.